Hi, I'm Derek Jensen. This is Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. My guest today is Guy McPherson. More than 10 years into a career in the academic ivory tower, McPherson turned his efforts on social criticism. These efforts continue with climate change a primary focus of his current work. He's the author of Extinction Dialogue. Well, first, thank you for your completely irreplaceable work. And second, thanks for being on the program. Thank you, Derek. I appreciate your work as well. And I very much appreciate the opportunity to chat with you today. Well, thank you. Um, so today I would like to ask you about something you've written. You said, quote, uh, civilization is an expression of patriarchy. Um, there, go. Talk for 45 minutes and I'll just <laughs> sit and listen. You know, I've been writing a bit about patriarchy over the last year or so at my blog at Nature Bites Last. And that work really was inspired by your work to a great extent. It took me a while to catch up with the notion of patriarchy. And so I want to talk about patriarchy just a, a little bit here. Um, contrary to prevailing opinion, it's not it's not men, it's certainly not all men who make up patriarchy. Not all men rule, not all men are fathers. And in fact, most men are exploited, just like I would argue most women. Patri comes from pater, which means father in Latin and Greek. And it can be traced to the Indo-European languages where it first appeared with the emergence of patriarchy about 7,000 years ago. Not surprisingly, and coincidentally, about the same time civilization arose. So one could argue that they are part and parcel, that they're really two sides of the same coin, patriarchy and civilization. In pre-patriarchal societies, the word father did not exist separate from mother. Mother is one of the oldest words in all regions and all languages of the world. But father was not something that was separate from mother. It didn't have its own term until about 7,000 years ago. From the time father was separated from mother as a, as a, as a separate word, the word father represented the image of, of rulers or of rulership, which is consistent with its current meaning. So the current meaning of father, which I would argue overlaps considerably with the meaning of ruler, is normal only in the sense that civilization is normal. So, you know, of course, it's all we've ever known. It's the source of the written record of humans, but, but to claim civilization is normal hence patriarchal, patriarchy is normal, is to deny the initial couple million years of the human experience, more than 99.7% of our existence as a species. So if we want to ignore all that and say that civilization is normal, well, let's keep in mind what normal really means in the context of the very long run of our species, not to mention the much longer run of life on Earth. So uh, something this makes me think of <clears throat> is Peggy Reeve Sanday did a cross-cultural study of high and low-rape cultures and trying to figure out, you know, what, what is it that causes a culture to be high-rape or that leads to high-rape. And she found a bunch of markers, and many of them are ones we would expect, like um, if it's highly militarized, it's probably highly rape. It has a high, there's more rape. If women and children are treated poorly, it's generally higher rape. And the, the one that I want to mention right now is that if the mythology, if, if the creator myths are of a, a male creator deity as opposed to either a female or a couple, then it's more likely to be a higher rape culture. And I'm just thinking about that in terms of what you just said, in terms of, of mothers being, of course, sort of eternally recognized and father recognition being more recent. Yeah, that's, that's fascinating, and I guess not terribly surprising that I'd say that the, the more carefully we look at what we consider deep time, and I'm, I'm only talking about a few thousand years here, I, I think the more closely we look at it, the at least for me, the greater the clarity is about these relationships, about the relationships between us and what we call them or the other and where that notion of us arises. 
And, and of course, that leads to things like rape and extreme violence against even members of the so-called in-group, that once we have these notions of, of for example, power um, then, and, and ownership, for example, then it's not too surprising that we uh, turn to violence and the notion of separation, of separateness between whoever's the us and whoever's the them. So let's let's back up a second. And when you say patriarchy, what what do you mean, both in in the sort of sense that you've already defined it, and then also what do you mean in in practicality? Well, I, I think patriarchy, in its at least broadest use, broadest application, is consistent with the notion of civilization of of some sort of power figure or ruler exerting extreme control through decision making over the other members of a family, band, party, group, uh, however however far you want to extend that. And and here I think as the most um, extreme contemporary examples. I think of things like the Church of the Latter Day Saints, uh, the, the the Mormons, which have a uh, an extreme patriarchal father figure who um, makes decisions that are uninfluenced to a very great extent by other members of the family, and that represent perhaps the purest expression of power within a small group. Now, in practice, you know, that's, that's a classic example because it is being practiced there. It's being exhibited, practiced, and normalized within larger society as well. Um, we, and, and, and to be clear, we don't need to have a Caucasian man um, at the reins, at the, in, the, in the position of power, to call the relationship patriarchal you know there are there are women and there's even a man of color currently in the oval office um, who are willing able perfectly capable of exerting hierarchy of exerting power from the top down onto the rest of the individuals in the society and, you know, the military, the United States military in particular, being the, the most extreme version of a killing force in the history of the planet, is a, another classic example of patriarchy in practice. It's all top down. It's the commander in chief, right down through the joint chiefs, right down through the generals, and, and then ultimately the cannon fodder uh, that are the, the people who, who sign up influenced by their own culture to be thrown into the brink of conquest to to to, to exert the power as commanded completely from the top down there's no there's no questioning that authority it is might be one of the reasons why uh, in recent years the number of suicides in the military exceeds the number of soldiers killed in combat by a factor of five uh, because there is no questioning the authority from above and some of the acts that are ordered and consequently carried out are horrific enough to cause somebody to commit suicide uh, once they once they follow those orders and and if they if they find themselves unable to follow those orders there's really no way out for them um, short of rebelling, hence ending up in prison, where they would undoubtedly be tortured like all the truth tellers that are imprisoned are, or committing suicide and, and, and taking the, the other way out, which is to, to leave this planet uh, of their own volition, uh, sort of, of their own volition. Um, so. so there's, there's a, a couple directions 
I, I'm going to say two things, and then you, you can take either one or both. And one of them is to, um, you know, you, you talked about patriarchy as hierarchy and, and domination down the hierarchy. And can you talk about civilization? I mean, Lewis Mumford talked about civilization as really originating with the, both with cities and also with the divine right of kings, and which is exactly what you're talking about there in, in terms of the, the, the father leader as it is. And then the other the other direction, which is which is just something else I was thinking about when you were talking, is that the other night I was over at my mom's and we were watching a documentary about um, some high school students in Salt Lake City who are really devoted to football and they're 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 Samoan and they're attempting to this is how they're going to make life for their family is by going to the NFL. And my point in bringing all this up is that and they were LDS too, by the way. Anyway, the, the point is that there was a scene in which they showed a coach, a high school, high school football coach, yelling at his students. And one of the things he was yelling is, the way you win a game is by destroying the will of your enemy, not opponent, not the person you're playing with. And, uh, you know, I love sports. And I used to be I used to be a high jump coach, and I would never have said to my high jumpers, the way you win is by destroying the will of your enemy. I would have said the way you win is by jumping higher than somebody. I mean, it's just, it's, and, you know, so my experience of sports, I've understood what people have said about football as war, and, you know, you can see it if you watch a game, but I've never, I mean, that was just such a wonderful encapsulation of everything that is wrong with that form of sport, where, how you win is by destroying the will of your quote enemy. It just, I, I was flabbergasted. Yeah. And, and full disclosure here, I used to be that person too. You know, I, I played all sports as a high school student. Uh, I was the quarterback of the football team. I was the person screaming those kinds of commands myself. Football is, I would argue the closest thing we have in uh, in in United States athletics to the military, um, it is extremely violent. It requires extreme physical contact. It is hierarchy in practice. You know the quarterback who reports to the offensive coordinator, who reports to the head coach, who reports to the owner. This is, this is all classic chain of command kind of stuff. And then out there on the battlefield, as it's frequently called, the quarterback is the person who makes the decisions about who goes where and who gets to literally carry the ball. And, and the, the consequences, of course, are horrific in many cases as 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 we see you know you know I, I actually as a as a social activity i went and watched the super bowl with friends and and it was heartbreaking to see all of those ex nfl quarterbacks go out there at the beginning of the game for the coin flip and they're all limping and and they're all in in really terrible condition for men their age who not that long ago were in unbelievably supreme physical condition. You know, these are the, the kinds of athletes who could run for miles and do all kinds of things with their bodies that most of us could only dream of. And now it's all they can do to get out of bed without experiencing horrific pain. And so football, I think, is, a, is the great American sport specifically because it brings to mind the other battlefields that that we have to a very great extent convinced people are good you know we we have this military culture that has convinced almost everybody within the culture that the military is necessary that those are people fighting for our freedom that we have a department of defense not a department of op offense. You know, the, uh, the the four horsemen of the apocalypse included war 
and conquest. And I would argue that what we're doing now is almost exclusively conquest. That's what we've been doing for a long time. That's one of the, quote, advantages of spending more on your military than the next 20 or 30 or 40. I can't even keep track how many countries in the world combined. So, uh, of course, what we're doing is conquest. As, as Bill Hicks, the American comedian, pointed out 30 years ago, it's not really war. War has two sides, has two armies that, that are some, sort of equivalent in some way. This isn't war. This is conquest. This is the United States military going over and conquering places for their fossil fuels, for their oil. It's, um, it's horrifying that we rationalize what we're doing in the rest of the world with our military and, and make a show, a spectacle of it, and, and link it directly to football, which is the great American game. And, you know, the, the, the military flyover, the, the, the whole Super Bowl pregame show was a testimony to U.S. imperialism. It couldn't have been more obvious to anybody paying attention, which excludes, of course, at least 99% of the people who were watching. And so that's kind of tragic all by itself. I want to I want to go back for a minute to your initial question, the, the kings and rulers and cities and so forth. Once once you have the cities, you have to admit overshoot. You have to admit that by creating those cities and having people live in those cities, that you're going to extract materials from beyond the city boundaries. That's the very definition of a city. And so what that means is somebody's got to take charge of that organization, of that wait, new wait. relationship you have with the planet. Okay, wait, wait. I, I, of course, completely agree with you, but can you back up and use an example or two to make this really clear? Because I think it's crucial, but I think a lot of people don't get it. So so you have a city. I mean, we hear all this stuff about how you can have sustainable cities, green cities. So debunk that, please. Oh, that's just... I mean, that, that, that's a that's a terrible idea. This is this is sort of like the the leaders of government corporations convincing us that that solar and wind will result in a new economy. It's it's not a new economy. It's the same economy. It's patriarchy. It's it's all top down. It's people living in cities. Once you have cities, you have to have rules for those people living in cities. You have to have blocks. You have to have police precincts that are dedicated to specific areas to control the the direction and magnitude of violence that occurs in those parts of the city. And and of course cities are incredibly violent, although and 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 they require incredible violence, although most people living in the cities aren't aware of that violence because for the most part it's being enacted on their behalf. The, the, the violence occurs outside the cities and to a lesser extent within the cities. You know, you have to have a mayor, you have to have a city council. We, we call this democracy or representative government, but try to have significant influence over what happens from the top down at the, at the level of the block party. And I think you'll find out that the representative government, the democracy, only goes to a very limited length to protect the interests of the citizenry. You know, once once you have organized uh, people into a, a set of living arrangements that requires them to capitulate to some level of leadership as cities do, then it's game over. You're in civilization. You no longer are in a band or a tribe. You're no longer, um, your, your life is no longer completely within the control of you and your neighbors that you might not even know, much less interact with on a regular basis. I, I want to connect this actually, to the notion of kings and rulers and with, with something Daniel Quinn points out. Daniel Quinn, the American writer, uh, author of Isha, Ishmael and many other books, um, points, that, points out that it, there, there are examples in contemporary society that are not what we would call civilization. 
This is not to suggest that at sometimes they don't have somebody acting as a ruler. And he uses the circus as a modern day example that is contrary to civilization. Within the circus, within the band of people who comprise a circus, there is the circus boss, and the circus boss is responsible when, when arriving upon a site. He or she is the person responsible for barking out the orders and making sure that all three of the tents are put up in a timely fashion and, and making sure that the, the apparatus is safe for the trapeze workers and so on. But nobody in that group that, that is the circus group, no, none of the people in that, in that circus group are, are willing to call that person the leader of the circus for all the time. When, when the trapeze artists are up there, they are in control. And they get to give the orders because they're the ones putting their lives at risk. It's only when the circus is moving, is breaking down, is being set up, is in the process of comprising the organization we recognize as a circus. It's only then that the circus boss is in charge of this whole operation. And, and so this idea of ruler is fluid and changes over the course of the day, over the course of the week. We don't have that in much of contemporary society, particularly if you live in a city. You don't have a mayor for the day. You have a mayor for four years or six years or whatever. You have a mayor for an extended period of time. You have a city council for an extended period of time. Yes, these people are selected or elected by the citizenry, but then they get to exert hierarchical power. And, and, and it's, you know, you don't get to say that, that John Doe, who lives at, at, at 13th and Stone, gets to be mayor for the next week and make those important decisions that affect everybody else in the city. It's not that guy who gets to decide, oh, we're going to start getting our water from over here and start from over there for this week alone. So you can have well-organized societies, as Quinn points out, up to a certain number of individuals and not have a full-time ruler, but, but you get beyond what is sometimes referred to as Dunbar's number of people, maybe a couple hundred people, and, and living particularly in a sedentary fashion, not acting nomadically. And now you're in a situation where, where hierarchy emerges essentially every time, every time I'm familiar anyway, throughout history, that we've had that set of living arrangements where we have more than a few hundred people and we're relying upon grain and, and, and so on, that always leads to, to hierarchy to, and, and thus to patriarchy, at least in my knowledge of this, of this situation. You know, I'm thinking of, of an example from my own life of the sort of fluid leadership um, that is, when I lived in Spokane, I used to go hunting with a couple of friends of mine who were really good hunters, and I was terrible. The joke I always made is the only thing I ever got is lost. Um, <laughs> I, I, I have, I've never actually shot a gun at a, you know, at a deer. I, I shot in target practice, but I never, I never actually saw one out in the wild. So, so leave all that, I mean, all the people who are freaking out about that can just leave that aside. The point is that we would drive out there. They were great hunters. We would drive out there. In the car, we're all equal, or in the truck, on the way out, we're all equal. We get out of the truck, they hand me my gun, and then they are completely in charge because I don't know what I'm doing, and they're actually really, really good. And uh -huh. if we would have done something where, um, I don't know, if the three of us would have been going to write a project, because I'm more experienced writing, I would probably have been in charge. It would just make sense. Um, right. It's all based not on a permanent hierarchy, but on uh, expertise for that moment. That's all. Right. That's an excellent example. You know, you, you go out there with a relatively few people, and everybody knows everybody. And if you're going to remain healthy, if you're going to remain safe in that situation, then you need to know everybody. You need to know what everybody's up to. It's when we get away from those situations 
that allow civilizations to arise. And, and it's very difficult for that to be anything except a one-way street. So let's, let's talk for a minute about micro scale. Um, how are, I mean, I've been thinking this whole conversation about the fact that we are two men talking about patriarchy, which is great, which is wonderful. And um, because men, you know, the, the problem with patriarchy, I mean, men need to deal with this. It's, it's not, that's not women's responsibility. But, the, but what I want to ask right now is how are men individually, I've been thinking about this a lot lately, how are men trained into patriarchy? I, I think in ways that they would mostly would not admit and probably would not recognize. You, you know, my, my co-host Mike Sleva and I talk about this now and then on the radio show. It's these, these hidden... Uh, assumption-filled relationships we have when we're growing up that essentially disallow us from even thinking about other ways of living. And Mike has recently written a book talking about his experience and, and couching that experience within the dominant paradigm, within this, this culture we live. And, you know, like everybody else, he grew up in this relatively, for in his case, it was relatively privileged existence. You know, he's he's a he's a white male, growing up in a family that's fairly privileged in the global north, like you know, not unlike you and me for that matter, in many ways. And and, and of course, he didn't know that there was anything else. You know, he he grows up in Wisconsin, and and everybody around him looks a lot like him, acts a lot like him, think this is the only way to live, and, and, and never really asked that question. Is there another way to live? Are there people on the planet living differently than me? Because, you know, when you're growing up, you, you tend to think that the way you live is the, must be the way everybody lives. I remember when I was a kid in a very small town, population 713 in northern Idaho, the whole time I was growing up there, the sign said population 713. And I remember going to the library. The library was just a, a, a two-room house, basically, a little tiny house that had been uh, sort of taken over and turned into the town library. And I remember by the time I was uh, 13 or 14 years old, I remember just assuming, not even really thinking about it, just assuming that that I would read all the books in the world. Because here I am in Weeab, Idaho, population 713. I've read all the, all the books, at least all the books that are of interest to me in this library. And sure, I know there's a lot of people out there. There's, there's millions or some other thing with an alien on the end that I don't really understand. But I just assume that I'll read all those books too. And, and I can clearly remember to this day walking into the University of Idaho library. And I walk onto the ground floor and it's a circulation desk and a bunch of magazines. And I remember thinking, and I, and I was probably 14 or 15 at the time, and I remember thinking, yeah, you know, it's okay. It's just a bunch of magazines. I don't really care about those. I'm still going to read all the books. And then I took the elevator, and I went up to the first of four or five uh, floors worth of stacks of real books. And the, and the library door, I mean, the elevator door came open, and I caught this musty smell of books. And to this day, every time I catch the musty smell of books, I have this very sad feeling that overwhelms me that that, that accompanied that initial realization that I'm never going to read all the books. I wasn't even going to read all the books on that one shelf. And it was devastating to me because I thought I was a smart kid and that I'd be able to do this. And and so that, that idea of scaling things up. So, so the elevator door opens and I catch this musty smell of books and I'm immediately sad because I realize I'm not going to read all the books in the world. I'm not even going to read all the books in the, on this one floor of this one library. I'm not even going to read all the books on this one shelf. And, and so, so that's when it gets real. That's when I realized at the age of 14 or 15 that, that we Ipe Idaho, population 713, does not scale up to the world. That we cannot take this, this example of my youth and, and, by extension, everybody else's youth of them growing up in this family, in this band, in this community. We can't scale that up to the world. It just doesn't work. 
it was so sad for me to, to, to achieve that realization. I, I'm afraid that a lot of people never reach that realization. They think that we can all get along in the world and operate in, in, in a way that everybody can get along. Um, but, but I don't see any evidence of that once we exceed a certain number of people and start living in these uh, patriarchal, hierarchal, civilized ways that, that essentially require violence to be maintained. And then not everybody's getting along. So the other day I saw – I think that what you're saying is really great. And the other day I saw this – somebody was, was asking a question on Facebook about how um, – what is the – most significant – oh, somebody was saying that in a class they were taking, the teacher had asked, what do you think is the most significant piece of technology that's ever been created by humans? And I was – so I was thinking about this, and of course, since I'm a big fan of Lewis Mumford, I was not actually thinking of physical pieces of technology like, um, you know, the wheel or, or whatever piece of technology you want, but I was thinking of – the social organization of the top-down hierarchical, what Lewis Mumford called a mega machine, which has the capacity to bring millions or tens of millions of people together for one uh, goal. And I'm not saying this is good at all. It's, it's been killing the planet. And it's killed, you know, millions and hundreds of millions of people. But I was thinking that 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 that's it's not scaling up. You're absolutely right. But that capacity to organize a large number of people into basically a slave force um, is, I think, the one of the um, – and I mean this in a negative sense – one of the crowning achievements of both patriarchy and civilization. Are we, are we getting at the same thing here? I, I couldn't agree more as you were asking that question. My first thought was fire and then – and then I said, and then I thought, no, it's the city, it's the social organization, it's the way we organize ourselves, that is the single most important piece of technology, and and I'm not I'm not sure that we can call social organization a technology, but but if we can, then I certainly agree that that's absolutely the most important, and and I'm saying that in a very negative way, it's the most important thing we've ever done because it allows a relatively few people to exert a tremendous amount of control over all of the rest of the people, all of the non-human organisms, and the what, what we call resources, the materials on the planet to boot. So you know it's it, it's a it's a strategy for all of the above in terms of lethality. And you know one of the things that that I find absolutely extraordinary about what Mumford called the mega machine, that, that type of organization, is um, my experience of small groups trying to work together is that I think um, I've come to the conclusion that, that we are in many ways, and probably songbirds are too, but we are in many ways a, kind of a contentious species in that we will have little squabbles with each other all the time and it can be very difficult to have an organization because person A's feelings gets hurt and then person B, you have to have these conflict resolution methods. But the thing is, if you have a top-down military style organization, they don't actually have to worry about that because they're, the people on top are systematically destroying the wills of those below. And so they don't actually have to worry. It's an extraordinary accomplishment to get 100,000 people to work together in ExxonMobil's interest. Or, you know, the U.S. imperialist interests. That's a, that's just an extraordinary accomplishment, given how much people like to needle each other. Right. Absolutely. And so, I, I think that um, sports such as football um, provide an opportunity for those at the at the reins of power to distract the masses. Yeah. You, you know, if you, if you if you if you contribute to, if you give the impression that football culture, that that competitive culture is a good thing, 
then it allows you to relatively nonviolently, it allows you to pit individuals within society against each other and therefore take out their aggressions, albeit in relatively minor ways, by screaming at the television screen while drinking beer. Um, and, and so, you, you know, I, th I think there are people who understand this, who who are, are taking advantage of the fact that we, um, at, at some level, that we are this sort of tit-for-tat organism that wants to squabble, that, you know, and an American philosopher, William James, as he was lying on his deathbed in New Hampshire in September 1911, penned an essay called The Moral Equivalent of War. And he wrote about how humans are, are warlike all the time, that we really just want to fight. And so the best thing we can do, you, you know, in the, the Great Idaho Fire, the, 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 the big blow up, as it's sometimes called, that burned three million acres in northern Idaho and western Montana was going on. And it actually obscured the sun for him in New Hampshire, in his New Hampshire cabin. And, and so the last essay he wrote was called The Moral Equivalent of War. He said, we got to stop killing each other. We're, we're warrior individuals. We're a warrior species. Instead of killing each other, we need to attack nature with all of our fury. And it was a defining moment for imperialism taking the next step beyond people. And now we're going to conquer the planet, the living planet. It's not just about people anymore. As it has been, as it had been for a couple of decades at that point, uh, U.S. empire was already um, well established as an entity that was worthy of pursuit from the perspective of the people pulling the levers of industry, and and so this next step is to is, is to herd nature to do as we want, and so w poor William James, the philosopher, just played perfectly into the hands of people who actually thought we could control every aspect of the living planet. And that led to the uh, whole series of decisions with respect to the, quote, management of how we deal with forests and rangelands and so on, uh, all of which now obviously we recognize 100 years later as being not so swift. But at the time, it, it seemed like they made sense. Well, you know, I, you and I agree on many things, but I'm going to have to disagree with you on something here, which is when you say that it's recognized as a failure, I think you recognize it's a failure, I recognize it's a failure, but I'm not sure that that understanding suffuses the culture. No, I absolutely agree with that. And uh, I mean, and, and part of, okay, I don't, know where, I don't know where you want to take this, but that's another thing that just gets me about this. This training into patriarchy makes us stupid. Um, I mean, okay, I am not criticizing you for watching sports. Tonight I am going to probably watch an a NCAA basketball game on TV with my mom. You know, it's like I like sports, fine. Um, but it breaks my heart that more key people care about any random NCAA basketball game or the Super Bowl or spring training of baseball or whatever, which is just around the corner, yay, um, <laughs> that more people care about that than care about the fact that there are, the mainstream press is even saying, and nobody cares, that the oceans could be devoid of fish in 35 years. Or, as you've been talking about, that humans could be extinct themselves within 20 years. And I, I find it completely st I, I've written 20-some books about this, and I still am stunned that um, more people care about the results of any game than care about continued existence of life on this planet in one form or another. And, and so I, 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 I don't know. I'm just, I'm just ranting. I don't, I don't, I, and my point is that, that I think that this training into this way of life makes us really stupid among other things or it makes yeah, us in absolutely. denial i absolutely i couldn't agree more i mean and and of course we grew up not questioning this set of living arrangements we we grew up not even thinking about uh how how we spend our days we just assume this is what everybody does and 
and and you do that for 10 years and then 15 years and then 20 years and then everybody's going to the ball game and everybody's watching the the same things on television you know you, you, there there are these these trending things on facebook and i'm i'm uh, I, i'm sad and 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 simultaneously grateful that you brought up facebook um, there are these trending things on Facebook, and every time I look over there, they're completely irrelevant things. Uh, I look there now, and they're all sports things. There's uh, NBA basketball, there's college basketball, and there's uh, National Baseball League baseball stories. Those, those are the three things that matter to Americans because sports matter, sadly enough. They, you know, as, as you were ranting, they – the, the sports themselves, the, the celebrity culture, the sports culture, the um, violence that is expressed, the competitive nature that is expressed in these team sports is what really matters because that's how we grow up. Those are the things that we're taught matter. And, you know, we're not, we're not even taught them overtly necessary necessarily is things like you know i remember being in seventh grade or eighth grade whatever it was and spring comes around and it's time for baseball season and, and and i can remember the teachers of some of my classes letting us bring a transistor radio to class so that we could listen to the baseball games and and i think now how absurd that is not that they teach things that are particularly important when you're in seventh or eighth grade and i would argue quite to the contrary that that indoctrination program is not necessarily helpful either but they thought it was important but not as important as having the the students who wanted listen to a baseball game and it just blows my mind to this day and to think that that was normal not so long ago <laughs> well i think um, we have about five minutes left, and, and I want to just mention one word and and a concept, and then after that I'll ask you a wind-down question. And the word and concept is seamless, because I'm, I'm pretty continually blown away with how seamless the training is that we get to um, in, into patriarchy. Um, I guess I, I want to give one another example. I was over at my mom's the other night, and... Um, and we're flipping through the channels, and then there was this show came on called Shark Tank. And what it is is people who a lot of times have lost their jobs become – then they come up with an idea, and then they try to turn it into a business, and then they go to the capitalists, and these capitalists will invest in their business or not. And the point is that the propaganda – it's just extraordinary to me that this comes after, two, after the collapse of 2008 – and the whole thing is basically Horatio Alger stories of how, yes, you, I understand you lost your job at the factory, but if you have a great idea, you can make a million dollars, especially with the help of the patriarchs, of these patrons. Um, and it's just I, – I keep wondering, and I see the same thing whenever I watch a movie where – there is like Dr. Zhivago where there's the, this rape scene that starts off as a rape scene and by the end of the scene she's pulling him close. There's tons of those scenes in movies and I just – I sometimes marvel at the seamlessness or another example, anytime anybody talks in the newspaper about any species extinction, they have to include how this species extinction is going to affect the economy. And my point is that no matter what direction we're talking about with this – the propaganda is completely ceaseless and it is um, seamless. Do you see what I'm trying to get at? Absolutely. Absolutely. Edward Bernays never could have imagined how successful the propaganda machine could become. But we're there now. It is seamless is the perfect word for it. Um, just last week, there was a paper that came out in an issue of Harmful Algae. There's actually a journal with the name Harmful Algae. <laughs> uh, oddly, there's there's no journal called Harmful Patriarchs. But in any event, the abstract of this paper says 905 marine mammals from 13 species were sampled, and they found no domoic acid was detected in all 13 species, harmful algae, and saxitoxin, another harmful algae species, was was detected in 10 of the 13 species. And this is the first time ever 
that those harmful algal blooms were showing up in the Arctic, in Arctic marine mammals. They were. Th this was in the Arctic Ocean. This has never happened before. It's terrifying. And and it is. It's it's terrifying. And and so of course the conclusion, the 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 assumption in the mainstream journal articles about it was, oh how sad for the animals. You know. If I were to represent the mainstream media, I'd go on to say that there's no evidence of any threat to human health. You know, we're mammals, too, and we rely upon the same web of life as other mammals, but we're clever. I'm sure we'll be fine. You know, that's sort of the mentality of the messages we receive every single day is that we're somehow superior. This this notion, as, as you wrote in your, your book that's about to come out, of human supremacy, that we're somehow – separate from every other organism on the planet that 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 it's it's not just american exceptionalism it's human exceptionalism we're actually different we're we're not the algae in the petri dish we're so much wiser than that uh it's it's mind-boggling that people can continue to believe that there's no relationship between us and them and that we can create a them without acknowledging that that's an us too it's it, as you said it's absolutely positively horrifyingly seamless the ability to report the so-called news in a way that makes us all feel good about ourselves and, and not, uh, not ever question the way we live as individuals, much less as societies, that it's all good because we're humans. It's stunning. So we have like, like two minutes left, and um, how, having been trained into patriarchy, what can you say to, in addition to what you've said, can you sum up, how in two minutes how we um how we men especially can attempt to um undercut the training that undo the training that has put us into patriarchy well it, it causes me such grief every time i mention the idea i get so much pushback as i'm sure you do too from from other people that i suspect for most people they would never even bring it up because it's just too hard. It's it's anathema to their daily lives because it will bring such pain to them by even bringing up the topic. Um, but that's what we can do. I think that's I, I'm not sure at this point that we can do any more than that is bring up the topic. Just bring it up as frequently as we can, and and point out that we actually are privileged humans we're, we're humans and we're white and we're in the global north and we have access to the world's reserve currency and we have all these advantages going for us and even acknowledging that will make a lot of people who look a lot like us uncomfortable and i think that's okay i i think discomfort is important is necessary if we're going to affect a significant number of people who was it who said that, that part of our job is to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable? I, I don't know who that is, uh, and, and, and I frequently spew it out, so I, I should actually look that up so that I can quote the relevant person who actually said that. Well, we'll but, just, but it's great. We'll, we'll say you said it for now. <laughs> well, a colleague of mine once told me that, that if you credit the person the first time, it's all yours from then on out. <laughs> well, so thank you for the conversation. I would like to thank listeners for listening. My guest today has been Guy McPherson. Thank you for your work. This is Derek thank Jensen you. for Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network.